Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone still awake from lunch? No? Cool. Don't worry, I'll try to put you to sleep very fast, so you won't have any problems. Uh, so whoever missed the first time around, since this is a community I'm not really, I've not really participated before, I'm Rafael Doms. Um, I'm from Brazil. Moved to Amsterdam last year. I've been working with PHP for over 13 years. Uh, and especially with uh, communities. Um, I'm now running uh, Amsterdam PHP. Uh, basically, it's a user group focused at, uh, in, in Amsterdam and the surrounding areas. Uh, and it's already my third user group, so apparently I like doing that. Okay, so Composer. Composer has been one of the new things in, in, in the community. Everyone's speaking about it. Everyone wants to, you know, is it good? Is it bad? How does it compare? Um, with pair, eh? compare, awful joke, yeah, I know. So the idea here is to really give you uh, an introduction to Composer and get you started using it. Um, originally, this talk was done as a Composer for busy developers. So the idea is to give you as much information as you can to, to really start working and start getting out, out there and using it. So the idea is I'm first going to give you a quick elevator pitch, what it is, what it does, how it does it. Uh, then we're going to go into everyday uh, Composer stuff, so things you're going to have to do constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, then we're going to go Maestro style, so a little more complex uh, things which you might need to use. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how it makes discovery easy and then all, all the package information and stuff. Cool. So, elevator pitch. We all know Pear or Peer. Pear? Peer? Pair, good. Everywhere you go, it's a different name. In Brazil, we call it Peer. It's weird. Anyway, so we all know Peer, right? So what's wrong with Pair, and why, 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 you know, wh what's going on here? So Composer is kind of like Pair, uh, but with a few different quirks. So the first thing is that Composer uh, is really focused on per project basis. It's really focused on doing your dependencies for that project. I mean, we all here work with, with projects, and how many times have you had a problem where one project was using this pair dependency, and the other project was using a different version of that dependency? Right? We've all had that problem. And that's because pair is very much system glo global focused, right? It's, it's system wide. Yes, you can do it per project, but it's so painful that you will give up. And yes, I have given up. Um, but also Pair, well, Pair has all the custom channels, right? But Pair as a concept is this one place where if you want to get your code into, you have to submit to so many steps and coding standards and all things that, you know, people stop doing that. Hence, all the custom channels, right? So it's all over the place. If you want to really find out what packages are out there, you need to know about the channels. If you don't know about the channels, you don't know about the packages. Does anyone know about the... Uh, Horde PHP pair channel? One person. Two. Yeah, for mail and stuff, right? So, you know, it's like we all know uh, the PHP unit channel, right? Because everyone's writing tests. Yeah, I just love when people are like, ah, tests. So it's very hard to find those. Whereas Composer, it has one repository. There's no rules to get your libraries on there. You know, it's just doing what a repository is supposed to do. It's just indexing all of these libraries. We as developers decide what is good and what isn't through our own channels, right? So it's open acceptance, no restrictions. It's, well, yeah, it, it, in, in a way, it's easy to get into, like uh, PHP classes. But let's not talk about PHP classes, right? So let's try and go on this in a problem solution. So the problem you have in your project today is you have a team you have a whole bunch of dependencies, but you need everyone to be working on the same version, right? Because if, if he's using PHP unit 3.5, you're using 3.6, and you're both writing code with that, at some point you're going to have a problem. If one person is using cake 1, or the other person is using cake 2, you know, the code isn't compatible. So you need everyone to be on, on that same version. Otherwise, you get the famous, well, it works on my machine which is not really an answer, you know, it's just... So we have gone through a whole bunch of these in the past, a whole bunch of different solutions. The first one we tried was Pair, 
at some point, right? But that's system-wide that has all these clunks we talked about. So, yeah, it doesn't doesn't really make it easy. Then we went through SVN externals. We all love SVN externals, right? It's it's good. It solved the problem back then. Had a few issues. It was always a surprise. But you know that didn't really quite solve the problem. Plus, it also focuses, you know, fixes you on SVN, which is probably not a good thing at this point. Then we have evolved to Git submodules, which is probably even worse than SVN externals, right? You have to get the whole project. You can't like get this single directory, and that just brought chaos to projects and autoloaders everywhere. So that's not also really good. Um, and then Symfony tried its own vendor management script, which you had to run, which was good. It actually did a good job of doing it, but it, it was also limited to libraries who, that were in GitHub, and, and, and you know it had its limitations. So also not the best thing. And then finally, now we have Composer. And personally, I have nothing to do with the project myself. I do contribute a few patches, but I believe it has a very clear purpose, and it it has a lots of inspiration, like uh, npm, or Ruby or the Ruby gems, or well, all of those, right? So elevate the pitch, lots of text. Composer is a per project dependency manager that allows you to declare a consistent list of dependencies and their versions. It makes it easy for you to share with your team so that everyone is using the same versions all the time, and it makes stuff easily findable, discoverable in packages.org. That's the elevator pitch. Cool? Questions? Good. Cool, that's it. And OK, well, what am I supposed to do with Composer then? Let's take the first steps. Installing Composer, pretty simple. You can do it locally, or you can do it globally. Differences. Um, I usually have a global version of my computer, because I'm using it for a whole bunch of different projects. And there's a few uses of it, which is useful to have it outside of your project. But if you're developing a library, and people are going to be contributing to it, or if you have a, an app in your team, uh, if you put it into your repository using the local method, it just makes it that easier. If you're going to do a deploy everything, you don't have to worry about your server having the, the executable or whatever. It's just in there. You just need to run it, right? So if you're going to do it locally, add it into the repository of your project. Uh, and if you're going to do it globally, basically, you just need to add install dir and put it, I don't know, in your bin file or something, in your bin directory. Uh, always good to keep those up to date as well. Um, good idea. If you're going to put it in your bin directory, yeah, just make a little symbolic link to Composer. You have to write a little bit less. Um, someone mentioned last time I gave this talk, if they're going to rename Composer to something really short, like, I don't know, CMP, I don't think so. But anyway, we're not going to die because we're typing in Composer. Uh, once you install it, you can then do a quick check to see if it's OK, running composer.far dash dash version. Uh, depending on your system configuration, you might need to add a PHP in there just to make sure it knows that it's PHP code. Uh, and you'll get the hash of the current version it has installed. Uh, very important, this is still uh, beta. So updates are going out all the time, constantly working on it and improving. Um, so it's very important to keep it updated. Uh, you can easily do that using the self-update command which will basically replace the current FAR with the new version. Um, very important to do this all the time. As I said, it's, it's still beta software, so you want to get the latest version. Cool. That's installing it. Questions? Good. OK. Composer 101. So I'm going to start a new project, and I want to use Composer in it. First step, you're going to create your Report your, your folder, right? Where your project's going to be at. Then, for Composer to work, you need to create the composer.json file, which is where all the configuration, where all the declarations are. So, this is a sample of a really, really simple one. 
using the Silex micro framework. Um, so basically what I'm saying here is, look, this project, it needs Silex. And then you're also using the minimum stability. So require, well, that goes into the root of your project. Um, but require basically says, um, OK, these are the packages that I need. You can specify specific versions. You can tell it to use the master branch. Uh, you can tell it to, you, you can use complex uh, expressions, like bigger than 1.0, but less than 1.2 all that kind of stuff. So you can really describe exactly what you want a uh, composer to get. Right? Uh, and then you have the minimum stability dev, which was added quite recently. So what this tag does is it prevents you from getting um, non-stable packages. Right now, to be honest, if you leave out the minimum stability dev, you will probably not get anything. Because most of the libraries out there are using Dev master or a development branch. Um, they're not really declaring versions 1.0 or 2. So if you use Symfony, OK, cool, you can get 2.0. But anything other than that is still development. It's beta, alpha, and that kind of stuff. So you want to set minimum stability to dev right now. Cool. So once you have declared that, now I say, well, this is my project. This is what I have. Um, you can run Composer install. So Composer install is going to read that, and it's going to say, OK, I'm going to give you this new folder with all your dependencies. So this is most of the output that it puts out. Um, you can see here, it's installing Silex on the third one here. But you can see a whole bunch of other stuff, and like, there's like five or six different things up there. What happens here is it's checking the dependencies you asked for, and it's checking the dependencies of your dependencies. So I depend only on Silex, but Silex depends on Pimple, on, on Symfony routing, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So what you're seeing here are the dependencies of your dependency, right? which is figuring it out by itself, getting the proper versions, and bringing those for in. And then finally, it's getting the library that you asked it for. Right? So you don't have to worry about, oh, I want to use just this little piece or that. Little. You just tell it what you want. It'll figure out what's needed for each of those uh, softwares. Um, well, it's dependency management. Th that's what you expect it to do, right? It also does suggestions. So for every package, you can suggest other packages which might make sense for the person to have. Uh, in this case, uh, Symfony Routing suggests Symfony Config and Symfony YAML, which let you create the configuration, uh, the routing configuration in a YML file, right? So it's suggesting, look, these are packages you might want to look at. So same thing for Silex down here. So these suggestions will probably get you some new features or you know, more advanced. So it's a good north to follow. Every now and then you find something interesting. After that's done, you have these two lines, and I'll get into them in a while. But it writes a log file, and then it generates the auto load files. So I'll explain those in a bit. So that's 101. You now have a base folder with uh, a vendor's directory and those dependencies are all in there. You can start coding. Well, you can almost start coding. How can you do it faster? So how can you pick up the tempo and really you know, get into coding much faster? So <coughs> Composer allows you to bootstrap projects. Um, if you look at most of the, the frameworks nowadays and all the applications, you get a lot of the skeleton applications which like, it's like a bare bones structure of whatever framework you're using with the framework plugged in underneath it. Um, so for example, Silex has one of those. Silex has the Silex skeleton. So if I use Composer Far create project and say, look, I want you to create a project based on that skeleton in that folder. What it's going to do is instead of putting the skeleton into my vendors folder, it's going to check out the skeleton as the root of my project. Right? So once I run that, I'm going to get a little bit of output. Basically, it's, it's going to say, look, I'm installing this skeleton, and then I'm getting all your dependencies. So it's going to get exactly the same dependencies we talked about in the last one, all the Silex stuff, pimple, blah, 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 the suggestions, and the log file, and the autoload. The only difference is that with our previous uh, configuration, all we had was a folder with a vendor's directory and a vendor stuff in there. Now, we actually have a folder 
which has the skeleton structure. So all the code that is in that repository skeleton is now checked out. So literally, now you have everything you need to start coding that project. So from zero to coding in one line, which to me is pretty cool. But there's also another side to the project. We all work with open source, right? Everyone contributes to open source? Everyone sleeping already because of lunch? Yes. Um, so when you want to contribute to a library, uh, you have to go figure out how to set up their environment, download their code, you know, your fork, and then you have to get all that stuff in place, and then get all the PHP unit, configuration files, blah, 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 and then you can start contributing. Well, Composer can also sort that out for you. If you want to contribute to a project, hey, it's easy, same thing. Um, so let's say DMS, that's a filter library I have. Uh, you want to contribute to DMS, right? Basically, you do the same thing. Create project, the library you want to contribute to, dash dash dev, which I'm going to explain a little bit, um, and then folder. What dash dash dev does is it says, look, give me all the development requirements. Because your project has two sets of requirements. It has the stuff that you use as an application, but it also has the requirements that you need if you're developing. So, for example, uh, the virtual file system wrapper for a PHP unit whenever you're testing file system stuff, right? You don't need that for the application, you just need that for the testing. So you can separate those things so you don't get all that stuff every single time. Right? So that will give you only develop all the, the, the dependencies plus the development packages. For example, you might have an, uh, uh, an extra repository with all of your, sorry, with all of your testing uh, libraries or configurations, and you can just pull that in for yourself. Simple enough, right? Uh, in the case of DMS, uh, I need to have Symfony and Doctrine there for the test because that's where it plugs into. So I need to have those in there uh, for the testing, right? So basically, you, de you define the required dev, which says, hey, this is only stuff when you're developing the library. Cool. So once you do that, you basically have all the environment that you can now start contributing to the library. You can basically just run PHP unit and you'll have the whole test suite and everything in there. Questions? Uh, well, in this case, uh, I'm not hitting the database. I'm just plugging into a few uh, libraries inside there, uh, and my tests mock the rest all out. So this just makes sure that the libraries I need to mock out and stuff, they're in there, and they know where to find each other. Cool. Um, well, cool. That's awesome. Contributing to projects is really good, and you should do it. But think back a while. Um, let's say, what? four years ago, three, four years ago. Whenever you used to use a new library in your project, you had one problem, finding the files. Then you had to require that one file from the library, which required a whole bunch of other files. And then depending where you put it, it wouldn't find the files anymore. We all remember require one's hell, right? We've all been there. And you know that changed. PSR0 came along. The autoloader stuff came in. So now we don't have to worry about you know, finding the right files. We just need to know that these classes should be in these files, and someone will figure that out for us. And Composer takes it an extra step. It actually says, hey, hey don't worry about the dependencies you're pulling in, how you have to auto-load them. Don't worry about that. I'll, I'll take care of that for you. And that's pretty cool. So Composer generates an auto-load file for all of your dependencies. Your whole project is taken care of by this one autoload. You don't need to have the, the cake autoloader or another framework. You don't need anything else. Composer will give you one, which stays in this folder, the uh, vendor slash autoload.php. This is all you need. It's what you're going to need, for example, in your test suite, that bootstrap file. This is basically, depending on your test suite, this is all you're going to need. Uh, but it can also take care of your own application, right? If you're developing an application, you have all of those vendors, but you also have your own namespace and your own stuff, which is in the application. 
So you don't want to have to add that to your whole auto-loading experience. So that's why you can use the auto-load uh, inside your own application or inside your own library to define. And we all know that, well, PSR0 is nice and all that, but not everyone is up to it, right? I mean, if you look at the, the pair libraries, there's a whole bunch of pair libraries which simply ignore PSR0 or just haven't been updated enough to, to get any of that. So with the autoload um, tag, you can actually use a few options. The first one, obviously, PSR0, you just tell it what the namespace is and, and that's it. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, but you can also do class maps, which is really useful for the pair libraries. Right? So class map basically will scan the whole directory, read all of the files, check what class is defined in there, and say, well, this class is in this file, this class is in this file. Right? Boom. Uh, and then finally, they added the files autoload. So <laughs> I thought, <laughs> I, I hope this wouldn't happen anymore, but I, last week I found a, a library which actually still uses this where you have to include this file every time you're going to use it, which defines like a whole bunch of constants and then requires another whole bunch of files. Have you all seen that? I think Facebook did that for a while as well. You had to include the Facebook, which they care like five different classes in one file, which is awesome. Uh, so you know, every now and then you need to make sure that that file is always included. So you can also use the files tag, which basically gives you that in a in a initialization uh, space where you can put all that stuff. So this, this can take care of all your auto-loading needs. If you have something that's not on there, well, show me, because that's probably very interesting. So this should take care of, of, of all those problems, right? And then you get into the everyday stuff. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you need to update your dependencies, you need to install them because you're deploying, uh, and you need to get new versions every now and then, but you just have to keep on moving, right? So how does Composer, Composer make sure that everyone's on the same page? How does it make sure that everyone uses the same versions? So two files in Composer we need to be aware of. Composer JSON, I just showed you, it's where we declare all those dependencies. And then Composer, well, it basically has all of that, right? And then Composer generates a composer.lock file. So this guy is basically the one that's going to hold all the information about what has been checked out. So it'll say which libraries it got and which versions of these libraries it got. Right? So this is what guarantees that you're all on the same page. Right? Very important. It's good to keep both of those in your repository, even if it's a library or, a, or an app. If it's a library, having the composer lock, make sure that everyone who's developing for your library uses the same versions you are using, so you don't have any surprises. But, okay, how does it work? Well, basically, Composer has two commands to handle these. First one is update, which will get the latest versions according to your definition, so you'll basically grab the latest commits of, of those branches you specified. Uh, and then you have install. So install is the one that keeps things on the same page. So how does it do that? First of all, Update will read your composer JSON, check out what libraries you asked for, work out all of the dependencies, oh, this one requires that one, requires the other one, blah, blah, blah. It'll resolve all of that. Uh, and then it'll you know, try and get that repository from, from GitHub or wherever it is. It could be a GitHub, it could be SVN, it could be a zip file download. It has various options, right? So it will find that library and get the latest version of whatever you asked, if it's 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, whatever. Once it gets that information, it will bring all that stuff back, and it will write the composer.log file. So it will say, look, for the DMS library, I got this commit. For whatever library, I got this specific commit. So you know exactly what it got, and you can stick to that, right? And that's exactly what install does. So install, reads the composer JSON, but instead of going to GitHub and getting that latest information, it compares it to the composer log file first. They will check, wait, OK, so you ask for this library. The log file says you got this hash. Cool. It goes up to GitHub and gets that specific version. So whenever you run install, you should always get the same version. There were a few bugs in there. 
most of them have been worked out already, but it'll basically mean you always get the same version. So when you deploy to a server and you run Composer install, you will get exactly the same libraries you were working in your developer environment. You want that. That's good. Because whenever you put something in production, you know, it always goes very well, right? Never has a problem, right? So that's basically how it keeps uh, things on the same page. And it's, it's very useful. So if you're developing in a team, very important, keep that composer.lock file in the repository. And you might want to pick one person in the team to be responsible for updating. Because then if multiple people are updating that file constantly, it's just going to get you know confusing to do the merges. And you want the whole team in one page. So let's say that at the beginning of every sprint or at the end of, the ver of every sprint, you update all your dependencies, you fix any issues that come from that because no one breaks backwards compatibility anymore, right? Never. So you know, pick a time to do that. And other than that, always use Composer install. So everyone stays on the same page. Cool. Um, cool. So that most of that is, is very valid for application developers, but you're developing a library, uh, a cake plugin, for example. Right? There's a few things you should remember to put in your JSON file as well. It's a big list. Uh, first and foremost, name. Right? If you're going to be sharing this with other people, you should pick a name and a namespace. Uh, they should be unique. Pick a good one. I've seen very weird names, but hey, eh? you can decide. Uh, then you have type. So type, um, what happens with type is right now you can, I think there's library and component. Those are the standard types that it has. But you can put anything you want. What happens here is you can create custom installers for Composer, which are basically custom installers. They're going to read and say, oh, look, this, this package is a, a cake plugin, for example. So instead of doing ABC, we need to do CDE, right? So this is where the custom installers will be able to hook on. So if, if the Cake community comes up with a custom installer for Cake plugins, you want to declare the type as a Cake PHP plugin, right? Um, keywords, description, always good to make sure people know exactly what they're getting. Um, and then a very important one, license. You know, license is something that we don't pay too much attention as developers. We just think everything is out there for the taking. And, well, I don't have to go into the whole patent war about Apple and Samsung, right? We all know where that stuff ended up. So it's very important for you to be aware of the licenses and always make sure your packages have a defined uh, license. Uh, you can also add uh, support information, so where to find your issues, where to find, you know, where to send emails, whatever, where to get in touch with you. It's always good if someone picks up your library out of the blue it knows how to trace back home, right? Uh, and then we have target directory. So target directory is pretty interesting. Um, I imagine with Cake, it might be the same thing. But with Symfony, if you're using bundles, um, they do a lot of that uh, subdirectory splits. So if you look at the, comp the, the repository, you have only the, the last folder of the namespace, right? You don't have the whole folder structure. But when you put that into a folder, you expect it to go into that full folder so the autoloader can find it. And that's where target directory comes in. So for Symfony bundles, we can say, hey, install this in, in Acme bundle, name of the bundle, and then put all the code in there. I can imagine with Cake, there might be the, the same situation. You want to put the plugins in a special place. Right? So this is something you might want to look at. Cool. So if you're developing a library, very important to keep all this information up to date in that library. We'll just make it easier for people to find it and, and use it. But managing dependencies is just not about libraries. It's about much more. Hey, if your code is 5.4, what happens? Right? You know, we all love to find this library which solves everything we wanted, and then we throw it up on the server, and boom, it blows up. Oh yeah, of course, my server is running PHP 5.2. So you want to know about those problems before you get to them, right? Uh, so Composer also allows you to, to manage uh, expectations about PHP. 
So you can do a, in the require, you can say PHP and you can use a version number, right? Just like you would use in a PHP version compare. And you can say, hey, this code is PHP 5.3 upwards, or 5.4, or 5. Point future something, point two one. Anyway, you can go crazy in this and just make sure you have the right versions. Uh, but you can also do that for extensions. You can say which extensions you need, uh, what versions they need to be in, and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I heard talk about also um, libraries, not, not libraries, but like for example, um, INTL and that kind of stuff. Who has ever been in INTL hell? Yes. So they're also working to try and see if we can get that information in there so we can avoid those types of problems. Fun, 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 fun. All right, so extension dash anything, you can check for any extension in, in PHP. Cool. That's the simple stuff. Did I lose anyone? Questions? Good. So let's take it a step further then. Um, so you're developing, right? Um, for example, in the past weeks, I've been working with the beta versions of, of Symfony 2, right? Like you would be working with a beta version of anything. And well, Symfony 2 does, does the whole development process very well. They, they are very good about not breaking backwards compatibility every single week. Oh, sorry, no, they're not. Yeah, so developing is really a pain because every week something changes, the framework breaks, all of the plugins, bundles, everything breaks, and you have to wait for all that to kind of stabilize before you can use something, right? So every now and then, you need to say, look, just stay on this version because, you know, all that hell is breaking loose and I don't want to get to that, right? But if, if, if it's on a branch and you're expecting that branch, it will always grab the latest commit. So how do you stop it? How do you make sure that Composer, you know, in case of emergency, you can just lock everything down and stay in those versions, even though you're updating other stuff. So that's where the modifiers come in. In this case, um, we have the hash ref. Right? Basically, I can say, look, use this branch for this library, but stick to that commit hash. Right? So that's git and the really nice numbers git has. So you can say, look, stay on this guy. Don't, don't, don't go further than him right now. I just want you to stay here. So even if you run an update, you won't get all those crazy things coming down because it's, it's locked down in your Composer JSON file. So it's like an extra lock layer. Um, but also maybe, so I, we talked about minimum stability. Um, you want to use stable stuff, but there's this one package which is not stable when you need to use it, but you don't want to put everything towards dev. Uh, you can also use the at modifiers, so you can get the dev and, and beta versions just for those packages. So this helps it figure out um, stability and dependencies, right? But then again, taking care of all dependencies in all your project is, is usually just not about getting that code. Every now and then you have to run a few things, right? After you get a plugin, it needs to, I don't know, populate the, the database or update the schema and that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that once some things are updated, other things are executed. You want to run a few scripts along with updating those dependencies. And Composer can also do that for you. So again, this is an example uh, from, from what happens in Symfony. Uh, they basically have all of their bootstrapping and cache clearing tied into Composer. So once you run a Composer update, it will clean up all the trash and just make sure that everything is regenerated for the latest version, right? I can imagine that would also be useful if you're developing a cake uh, application, right? So the scripts tag uh, lets you run scripts at specific times. So post install, pre-install, post update, pre-update. You can basically put all that stuff in there uh, as well as the custom installers, which you can also write. So it's very flexible. <laughs> but cool, awesome. Everyone's using Composer, right? All, all of, all, everyone here has already put their libraries on Composer, right? No, you haven't, right? Because now you're finding out, oh, how great Composer is. So what happens if I'm trying to use a library that is not in Composer? 
Am I stuck? Do I have to just copy it and paste it in my vendor's directory? How do you handle that? How do you overcome that lack of Composer? And the great thing is, that's easy. So, two situations. Either it's a package that's not a Composer, or I'm using your plugin, right? It's great, thanks, it really helps me. But I found this place where you have a bug and I'm fixing it, but you're only going to have time to merge it next week. So am I stuck until next week? How can I make sure that I'm using my branch or my fork instead of the original library? That's very useful, right? We're all waiting for other people to have time to uh, fix their libraries. But we already have that going and we just keep going. Our clients are not waiting for, you can tell them, oh yeah, well, we were going to deliver this week, but you know, Composer updates, I'm going to have to wait a little bit more. You can tell them that. doesn't work. For some reason, clients don't care. So cool, I'm using the superhero package. Nice, awesome, awesome package, does a whole bunch of stuff. It's also pretty nifty. But I found a bug, so I forked it. And I fixed it, right? I want it to be a little bit more discreet. There we go. But now I need to tell Composer, hey, use that guy instead of this guy. But Composer has already looked at this guy and knows there's a composer.json file in there, which says everything about the package and all that. So I tell him, look, I already have that Composer file, but I'm declaring the same package. I didn't change the name of the package. That package is still the hero super package. The Composer file is exactly the same, I just changed something inside the, the, the package. So basically, I can use the repositories tag and tell him, look, there is a version control directory or repository at this, um, at this address. So Composer will go to that address, will read the composer.json file in there, and say, hey, this is the definition of the hero super package. So when it tries to get the hero super package, it will get that one and not the original one because I told him, hey, use this one. Forget about the original one, use mine. Right? So once the superhero package is fixed, you can then remove this and keep using the other one. But this you know, lets you keep going. Right? So repositories allow you to overwrite existing repositories or non-existing repositories and on the fly. Cool? But then we get into that, yeah, that package is not on Composer, and we need to get that sorted out. So we can use the type package, right? Type package basically says, look, I'm going to declare this package on the fly for you. So all this information, name, version, source, that's all information that's in your composer.json file, right? But I'm telling him, look, look, it's, it's right here. This is the library I'm using. This is where you're going to get it. This is the version it has. And, and then I just put into my require whatever you know, I want. This can be SVN, this can be Git, this can be GitHub, whatever you want. Right? And once I do that, I can easily go into my library now and say require smarty smarty. It knows where to find smarty now. It's not a composer file. It's not a composer repository. It doesn't know what it is. But I told him, so he said, okay, cool, I'll trust you and get that information, right? This is very useful if packages you're using are not in Composer yet. Cool. But, you know, we're all old school. So I need this package and this package is in pair. Ah, <sighs> fun, fun. Using pair packages is always a surprise, right? But then now you're going to have one pair in, you know, pair is going to be system wide. Then you have composer local. Oh my God, this is even worse than using just pair. Nope. Composer wraps pair. That's awesome. <coughs> is, is anyone as happy about that as I am? Good, good. Because it will just be awkward if it's, I'm the only one happy, you know, it's just weird. So, uh, you can easily go into the repositories tag again and add a repository of type pair and point it to the pair2 channel, to the pair PHP unit channel, pair horde, whatever. You can just add those channels in, right? Uh, and then once you require those packages, you just need to remember to add the prefix, which is pair and the name of the channel, in this case, pair2. 
slash, and then the name of your package. It will go into pair, it will check out that package for you, it will put it into your vendors folder, so it's per project. It will also get all the class map, everything it needs for that library. It will do everything for you. You can just start using that pair package and not worry about all the pair madness. Small disclaimer, if you are going to use pair, it's going to take a little bit longer for you to do a composer install or update because it needs to do a whole bunch of checking with pair and, and very verbose and stuff. So it does slow it down a little bit, but nothing that really, it's not really a problem. Cool. Few more. Um, these are very useful comments when you're in a, in a tight situation. Uh, first of them is alias. So if a package depends on version 1.1 of a library and you have your own bug fix branch and you know it still says, hey, but I need 1.1, you're telling me to use this branch, it's not 1.1, what the hell? Right? It will fail. So you can use alias to say, look, use that branch as if it was 1.0. Right? So it will be able to sort out the dependencies. Uh, replace, also very useful if you want to replace a package. So you can say, for example, my DMS filter library replaces, uh, I don't know, Zen filter, for example. Right? So you can say, look, use this one in the place of that one. Uh, and then provide, is a little bit more complex, but I'm just going to mention it, uh, where you can say, look, this package, it provides caching. It provides logging. Right? So you can also do generic uh, provisions. So it's a little bit more complex and still a bit unstable, but useful nonetheless. Cool. That's the advanced stuff. Did I lose everyone now? Yeah. Could, could you nudge him? He's sleeping. I'm kidding. Cool. Um, so, you know, dependency management is also not just about managing them in your project. It's also about finding. It's very hard, and we were discussing this this morning as well, finding WordPress plugins, uh, finding uh, Cake plugins, or, or just finding stuff that's going to complement your, your work, right? You need to be able to find these libraries, and as a, a library writer, you want people to find your library easier, so you don't have to go and talk to everyone and be famous before your library is used by everyone. So Composer does a really good job at finding stuff. So you need a library. You need a library that does something. So let's say filtering, right? In comes packages. So packages is the central repository for a composer. If I go up to packages, I can have this huge site search thingy, just like Google, and I just type in filter. If I type in filter, it'll start listing me a whole bunch of different libraries which um, deal with filtering. Remember the keywords and description? That's exactly where it's going to look at. So in this case, this is, these are my libraries. It's a filter, annotation-based filter. Sorry, I can't talk about annotation. Is Mark here? Oh, I can talk about annotations, cool. So it, right, that's basically what it does. So it's easy enough to find. Once I find it and I click on this library, it will take me to the page of that specific library and will give me a whole bunch of uh, really important information. So uh, how many people are installing it, um, what it requires on a developer environment or not, uh, all the versions I have released of it, what current versions are there, what's stable, what's beta, all that kind of stuff. So you get all that information that was in the Composer JSON file plus a few more, right? All the tags and stuff. So it's pretty easy to see if this library is going to do exactly what you want it to do. If, of course, they did a good job at writing the Composer JSON file. But cool, not everyone likes the web. You can do it from command line as well. Composer search, filter. It will get me that same result as we saw, a list of different libraries, and we can just pick and choose which one. Right? If I want to get more information about it, uh, same thing. Show, name of the library, it will get me that information. So all the name, descriptions, keywords, how it does auto-loading, what it requires, and all that. So it's really nifty for you if you're, find, if you're looking for something like, I don't know, a HTTP library, for example. Easy enough to find. But, you know, not the whole world is open source. And you have a whole bunch of libraries you write every day at the office, right? Does anyone here write 
their own packages and stuff at the office, which is not open source. Cool. You have a private repository on GitHub or something. How do you manage those dependencies, which are private, with Composer, which is a very public library? So that's where Satis comes in. Satis is packagist for your company, right? It's a very simple version of packagist, which basically indexes your own libraries, right? If you look at it, um, when you're deploying to your server, your server has access to your GitHub repositories, right? Because it's checking out code from there all the time. So basically, this just makes Composer find out where to ping, and your own infrastructure will take care of the rest. So in this case, this is my, my, my employer, Webclusive, uh, and we have our own uh, package uh, repository with the standard bundle library where we put all of our bundles, right? So basically, I told them, look, this is, the, this is the repositories I have. Find any package that's in there and list it so that people can use it internally. Um, to roll out Satis, it's really simple. Create project, Composer Satis, remember, create project will give me the whole skeleton thing. Basically, you do that, and then you create a configuration file. So this configuration file, what you need to do is tell him the repositories. So these are your own private repositories, be them on GitHub or a private SVN or whatever. As long as your server has SSH access to those and can you know, sort out the, the authorization, that kind of stuff, it will basically get a list of all those packages. Once it gets that list, you just have to run build config, and it will give you that web page I just showed you. A web page is basically a static web page with a JSON file, but Composer will always ping that file to find out where library X is. To use that, Go into your own repository tag, composer type repository, and point it to your own uh, packages URL, right? In this case, packages.yourdomain. And then you just require your own package, because then composer knows exactly where to look for it. It's a private repository. It will be able to get in there, get the code, and come out. And you have managed your private uh, libraries as well as your public dependencies. That's pretty useful, right? So. Cool. Um, Composer is still pretty new. A um, few months ago, when Symfony made the switch and then everyone was forced to use it, it, it was still very bad. It had lots of issues, but it matured a lot since then. And, and the, the community, the people behind it are very, very good people and very helpful. So if you need help, documentation, very good. It's very complete. Lots of different uh, examples. Uh, but they're also always on, on IRC, on, on Freenode. So you can talk to Saldek or Nils or Igor. They're always there to help. They're really, really good people. Uh, I often am hanging in there as well, so I'll be happy to help anyone uh, if they have a problem. But you know, these guys really put a lot of effort. And in the past four months, they matured the library a lot. And it's just like it's become part of my must-have uh, things in a project. So. Just to remind everyone, elevator pitch, Composer is a dependency manager. It will keep everyone using the same versions in your, your team. Um, stall, update, the lock, and the autoload files. It does all that for you. This is what you need to know on a day-to-day -day basis. If you need more complex stuff, you can always overwrite. You can create packages on the fly. So that really helps you out with you know, getting everything in your project through one channel only, uh, and then you have status and packages to help you find stuff, right? Once again, thank you very much. Uh, please give me feedback on joined in. Um, slides will be online shortly, hopefully. Uh, and if you have any questions, just go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> so questions? Go for it. Bundler is from Ruby, Ruby yeah. Um, it has taken a few lessons from there. I'm not exactly sure which and what, because I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, but talking to, to the team, I have heard Bundler come through. Uh, NPM is also a point of uh, inspiration. 
if you look at a composer JSON file, it looks a lot like a, an NPM package, like what you use for Node and stuff, right? So it, it has taken a lot of lessons from there. If you're trying to update, yeah, it'll probably crash. Um, if you have the lock file, I'm not 100% sure they were working on that, but I'm pretty sure it can sort it out by on, on its own. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it depends on how you're working with, with things. Uh, on a general basis, I don't really commit all that because, you know, my server is always there, blah, blah, and, and everything is on status. But it, it's a good fallback, right? Anyone else? Yeah. To parse faster the, the JSON file and get that. Yeah, it it's been getting better. Uh, one of the issues they're tracking down is 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 memory overflow issues because it, it does a lot of parsing and stuff. Uh, they're still working on that. Um, there has been some improvements, but it's not ideal yet. But yeah, they're aware. It's, it's, it's one of those things, right? It, it, it has to do a lot of, of calculations depending on the versions you have and, and all that. So it, it's a little bit heavy at points. But mostly it gets the job done. If you try to run it on a micro instance, it's actually pretty good on, on Amazon. If you try to run Composer on a micro instance, you might have problems. My tip, enable swap in that micro instance, you'll get through. It will be a little bit slower, but y it'll get it done. But yeah. You could also commit a dependency. If you know yeah, of course, yeah. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you.